Welcome everyone, I'm Congressman Jared Huffman and uh, we are now live. I'm so excited to have you joining us for this uh, online town hall on equal justice and police reform. And I want to introduce you to three very special guests that are joining me for this town hall. The first is uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass, who chairs the Congressional Black Caucus. Karen Bass and I go back a long time. We served together in the State Assembly. I used to call her Madam Speaker. And uh, <laughs> she is a fantastic leader and a great friend. And uh, here's a little uh, news flash. Not everyone in politics is a warm, engaging, wonderful human being. Uh, Karen Bass is all of that. And she's just one of my favorite colleagues in every way. Also joined by two of my local constituents, each of which I would consider leaders in their own right uh, in the African-American community and beyond, starting with uh, Curtis Robinson of Mill Valley, prominent physician in Marin County, also an elected member of the Marin County Board of Education. Uh, like me, Curtis graduated from the greatest university in America, UC Santa Barbara, uh, <laughs> and uh, did some amazing work on, on equality and, and civil rights there and has continued to just be very engaged in the community doing all kinds of good work. So I really welcome his perspective in our conversation. And then a little further north in my district on the coast of Mendocino in the town of Fort Bragg, uh, I have a high school, his, uh, high school teacher teaching uh, English and digital media right now. Uh, uh, Marshall Carr uh, is, I guess, the youngest member of this conversation. Uh, but he is an extremely thoughtful writer and community leader uh, coming to us from uh, a little bit of a different part of the geography I get to represent. So we're really grateful to have his, his input as well. We're going to kick things off uh, by going to you, Karen Bass, and uh, talking about the policing reform initiative that you are leading on behalf of the Congressional Black Caucus. And it's something that that frankly just has generated an awful lot of support and excitement. I've never seen a package of reforms this ambitious with so much broad support. Tell us a little bit about what we are attempting to do in this moment and why. Absolutely. Well, we are attempting to respond to a moral moment in our country. And let me just say that um, it is wonderful to be here with you. Jarrett is uh, one of my best friends in Congress, somebody where we went through the wars together in California. Uh, Jarrett Huffman and Patty Berg, who I know is listening and watching here. I had the opportunity to visit your district one time. It is beautiful. And I look forward to being able to go back again. Well, he's an outstanding leader in Congress, but I know you guys already know that. So we are in a, a period in, in our history. I've seen many moments before back to Rodney King when the video happened and I thought everything was going to be fine because the world saw it and no one was going to be able to deny it and that was going to be it. And then what happened? A few years later, after all of the blow up around the country related to that, cell phone cameras were invented. And then we saw numerous examples of police abuse, even murders. But what happened after almost every one of them, people immediately began to question the person that was dead or the person that was beat up. Well, we don't really know what happened before the tape and we don't really know about this person's background. Uh, and as though, you know, being arrested and tried and being innocent until proven guilty just flew right out the window when it came to these videotapes. But I think that the torturous slow murder of George Floyd that the entire world witness was just a bridge too far. And it has led to the thousands of protesters that are out there, but it also led to us to act. And so I am honored that Madam Speaker, the Madam Speaker, <laughs> asked me to take the lead because of my dual role. My role one as chairing the Congressional Black Caucus and my role in chairing the subcommittee and judiciary that handles this on crime. And so a few features of the bill, accountability, removing qualified immunity from police officers, which is one of the reasons why you saw that officer just sit there and look dead in the camera with complete impunity because he knew nothing was gonna happen to him. Although of course this time he was wrong. Um, the duty to intervene, those officers, well, two of those officers also participated in the killing. One officer was acting like a lookout our bill would require those officers to intervene when they saw something like that. A database, Tamir Rice would have graduated high school. He was killed when he was 12 years old, six years ago. 
by a police officer who thought a 12 year old was a threat, who had been fired from another police department because of his instability and propensity to violence. So a national registry where that police chief could have found out that this guy was unstable. Breonna Taylor would be alive today if no knock warrants for drug cases were outlawed. Uh, the chokehold, um, that should be illegal. Eric Gardner and George Floyd would be alive. Militarization of police departments. Why do our police departments need to look better armed than the military? You know, around the world, people are questioning us because in a lot of countries, and I focus on Africa, a lot of countries, we're always horrified when they see them send the military out to resolve a domestic, um, a domestic unrest. Well, what did we do? <laughs> we sent our police departments out, but they look like the military. And then we added the National Guard onto that. So the other part about the bill that I want to mention, and then I'll stop, is the uh, attempt to help officers because there is no, there are no national standards. There is no accreditation. To get your hair cut, your barber has to be accredited. So certainly a, a profession that has the ability to kill you should be, should have national standards and accreditation. And then we are providing grants to communities so that they can re-envision public safety in the community. And you know, we have all, our budgets are all out of balance. We have decided to criminalize health social and economic problems and then we've left the police to deal with the consequences and so really looking at police budgets looking at how we go about keeping our community safe all of that is incorporated in the bill that will be named the george floyd justice and policing act tomorrow yeah so you've mentioned a few of these names that have become infamous i mean george floyd is a is the biggest of all probably but just in the time you and I have served together in Congress, this is my eighth year. You know, there have been Trayvon Martins, there have been, Bri you mentioned Breonna Tess, so many of these. And yet, uh, we, we haven't been able to leverage these moments of outrage into real reform. Uh, right. what, what do you think could be different this time? And how do we make sure that we, we get it done? Well, first of all, we have to stick to our guns. I mean, what uh, Trump did, what the president did today, and what the Republicans did, which in a way I'm encouraged by, and I, I think uh, Representative Huffman uh, can understand what I mean, they're all taking our, our categories. <laughs> now, they're taking the teeth out of them. For example, they don't say ban chokeholds. I think we need to study chokeholds. <laughs> Breonna Taylor was shot 12 times in her sleep because of a no-knock warrant. Well, they say, let's collect the data on no-knock warrants. Hundreds of thousands of people are out in 50 states in our country. This is not the time for vanity legislation. This is the time for substantive legislation. And we have got to demonstrate to the people out there on the streets that we are serious. You've probably uh, had a chance to read President Trump's executive order more closely than I have just seen the reporting on it. But it looks like entirely voluntary stuff, grants and studies. And uh, that seems to be a major uh, distinction between what we're trying to do, actually mandating uh, some standards, actually requiring uh, these registries and this transparency and, you know, taking on these doctrines of qualified immunity, changing the mens rea requirement from, uh, from uh, willfulness to recklessness, which is the only way you'll ever have criminal accountability for, for a murder uh, carried out uh, in, in the course of your work as a police officer. Um, why is it so important that we have teeth uh, in these measures? Well, because otherwise nothing will change. And, and you're right, that's, that's what he did. It is called smoke and mirrors versus substance. And, and now I even think our bill, there's so much more we need to do and should do and will do. But this is a very important first step to try to put a change in police culture. And I do believe that there's a lot of police officers. I've been talking to the unions. I've been talking to the police chiefs. I've been talking to everybody. And there is some common ground. But I was encouraged by the fact that they took our categories. <laughs> yeah. Because you know what, what has happened, Representative Huffman. When we do something like guns or health care, they reject it wholesale out. Yeah. They don't even come near yeah. to where we are. Here, they took almost each one of our categories and just pulled the teeth out of it. 
I think they so realize, our job uh, is going to be getting it over to the Senate and putting the teeth back in the bill. Yeah, they, they, they realize something has changed in, in the public opinion, and uh, they're trying to at least to appear to be on the right side of it, right? Exactly. Um, so talk about where it goes from here. Um, next week, we're all heading back to Washington, and um, we will be voting, I think, this package or something that yeah. looks a lot like this package off the floor of the yeah. House of Representatives. Nope, we will be voting this package. Tomorrow we're having the voting committee that we refer to as a markup. And next Thursday we will be voting on the bill. And I will tell you that it usually takes a long time to get all the Democrats on the same page. But within 72 hours, we had the majority of our caucus. And right now we have 227 co-sponsors. Now we need 213. If you're a co-sponsor of a bill, that means you most assuredly are going to vote for the bill. We need 213 votes to get it out of the House. Now, there's 235 Democrats, so 227 co-sponsors is really, really good. And um, I don't expect any Republicans to come on board right now. I think it's just we've moved too fast for them. But, um, but I am encouraged by the fact that they're doing their own bills. So I know tomorrow in the uh, markup, they will be introducing amendments that mimic our bill. And I've never seen that before. Do you think we might get Justin Amash? He has been critical of qualified immunity, for example. Right, he has. He's not on judiciary. I don't okay. think he is. Yeah, he's so not on judiciary. We'll see where he is on the floor vote. Uh, right. Then this, then this goes right. to the Senate, though. And, and uh, Mitch McConnell has, uh, again, at least paid some lip service to the issue. He's, he's put Tim Scott uh, in charge of leading some kind of a Republican a study group. Uh, what are your expectations over there? Well, I've talked to Tim, and uh, Tim introduced his bill today, and Tim's bill pretty much mirrors the executive order. And so, again, they take up parts, but they don't really do uh, very much. I've also talked to Kevin McCarthy, and um, and I believe they, they know that this is an inflection moment in our country, and they are going to try to do uh, something. Now, I think when it goes over to the Senate, oh, by the way, I mentioned Tim Scott, but Senator Harris and Booker, mm -hmm. we wrote the bills together. So their bill will be identical to the one that we vote on uh, tomorrow. So I think that, um, you know, that's when the negotiations begin. That sounds great. Uh, let, let me ask you, um, Congresswoman Bass, uh, about uh, kind of beyond just the police abuse piece of this. Our country's having a really seemingly yes. different conversation about systemic racism. Police abuse is one aspect of that, but it's not the only thing that we're talking about. All over this country, communities are reconsidering you know, the way in which they may have had policies or institutions or symbols or place names, parks, monuments. I mean, th this is a really different conversation. <laughs> uh, what's your sense of, of where that fits in? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, it's always interesting when we come to the subject of race in our country because we just can't handle it. I mean, one of these days, the U.S. will actually come to grips with our own history. We only like the nice parts of our history, like the cherry tree about Washington that I don't think ever even happened. Yep. Uh, but we don't necessarily want to talk about him as being a slave owner who viciously went after his enslaved uh, people that he owned. Um, but I think that we're beginning to uh, have a second look. I mean, I wish you all the look, Marsh, Marshall, anything I can do to support you. I know you guys are considering changing the name of your city. But just stop and think about that for a minute. We have military institutions named after traitors. How does that work? <laughs> we have military statues in, in, in the U.S. Capitol. War. We have mass murderers in the Capitol and statues to them. Yeah. And so I'm very happy that Madam Speaker, she can't necessarily get rid of these statues because individual states put them forward, but she can move them. So it's going to be interesting to see where those sta where those statues yeah. wind up. There might be a utility closet somewhere where <laughs> Jefferson exactly. Davis could do some good work. Uh, that's a great idea. Uh, well, th this is a, a great opportunity for me to turn to my constituent members of this conversation and uh, let me start just by order of seniority. Dr. Curtis Robinson. Um, uh, Curtis, do you want to ask um, Congresswoman Bass any questions? Um, you know, I don't want to ask a question, but I just want to say how proud I am of the Congresswoman oh. and the entire Black Caucus 
Thank who you. is represented with 55 members in the Congress. And, and the, the other day when you presented this bill that we're talking about today and you wore the Kinte garb and you had uh, Madam Pelosi wearing the garb, it was just a special moment for I'm sure not only me, but my five children and yeah. many African Americans and people of color across the country and the world, just to see that and hear that and to know that you're leading the way in this fight that so many of us have been in since we were born and before us and, and onward. So thank you so much, Congresswoman. And Jared, thank you for honoring all of the work that all people of color are doing. And now yourself, who has always been committed to these causes, yes. um, it's just a very special moment in time and I couldn't be prouder. Thank you. That was the nicest thing. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Curtis. Let's go over to you, Marshall. Uh, any thoughts for Karen Bass? Well, I don't have a direct question either, but I do appreciate everything you're doing. And and as far as um, and what Curtis said too about, uh, I have two children, and they're watching this right now, and they're able to see um, folks standing up and fighting for this kind of stuff. And it's 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 frustrating, you know, in the conversation around my town right now about that. Yes, we are named after a Confederate. General, but I'd like to, you know, if that I would like to see that change. Um, and most people, when I say where I'm from or where I live, they go, "Oh, that's a military base in North Carolina, right?" And I say, yeah. "No, actually, we're on the North Coast." But again, it's the same uh, naming. So I don't, I don't know. I, I thank all of you for having me on here, and I really appreciate everything you're doing. And I would love to see these reforms happen um, across the police department and stuff like that. And it's, it's really important to us. Um, who are raising kids in this world right now. It's 2020, we're still having these conversations. So well, well, we're gonna- well, Please we're, let us know if there's anything we can do to support your name change. Thank, thank you, you, Karen. And, and I'm, I'm gonna come back to Marshall and Curtis a, a little bit later after we let you go, because I wanna ask them to just share their lived experiences as, as black men in America, uh, things that we all need to just stop and listen to. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited about hearing from both of you in that regard. But while I've still got Karen, uh, and we'll go to uh, some Facebook questions from folks who've joined us in just a moment, but um, Karen, there, there's a lot of talk. Uh, when, when you were getting interviewed by Chris Wallace on Fox Sunday morning, and you did a fantastic job, uh, they want to talk about this defund the police movement. They want to talk almost entirely about the defund the police movement because they really want to put us into this box that they think plays into the law and order narrative against us. Um, talk a little bit, if you will, about those words uh, and you know the broader contextualization of this conversation. Sure, well, you know, what, what's at the heart of it to me, and, and 30 years ago, by the way, in 1990, I started a grassroots organization in South Central Los Angeles because we saw the divestment beginning we saw budgets being cut. We saw cities being, you know, losing major programs, the safety net being stripped, uh, block grants coming in place. And I think, although we've kind of always had this tendency, but that's when you saw the beginning, uh, the beginning policies that were put in place that really led to mass incarceration. Everybody talks about the crime bill, which was significant, but there were a lot of policies that were put in place and I started that organization to fight against that. And here we are 30 years later with the consequences. And what has happened is, is that over time, city budgets, especially in regard to the police part of city budgets, have grown and grown and grown while we have divested from dealing with social, economic, and health issues. So for example, in Los Angeles, we have a jail called Twin Towers. It is the most expensive military uh, um, uh, mental health institution in our country. And it is a jail. Thousands of people are in there because that's what we do to the mentally ill. And so uh, in Los Angeles on any given evening, and this is LA City, we have over 40,000 people sleeping on the streets and all that that involves. So when we divested from communities, we left it to the police to pick up the pieces. And so part of what is at the root of that, of this movement and that call, obviously I don't support eliminating police departments or taking all of their funding away, but at the heart of it, the idea that we need to have a conversation in our country 
to say, why is it that we are so willing to spend money on police and jails and we fight over a $400 check for food stamps for a family? As long as we, plan, as long as we continue to not supporting families in trouble, then police budgets wind up expanding because we have criminalized our social health and economic problems. And I believe that's what's at the heart of it and that the, the Republicans and the right wing have seized on it to try to divide us from each other. And we should not accept that division. I, I don't know anyone, Karen, maybe you do, but uh, even in Minneapolis where you know we hear these reports that the city council is defunding the police, they're going to have a police force. Uh, right. There will be law enforcement. Uh, nobody is pretending that somehow, you know, we've achieved uh, some utopian status where we never have crime and never have a need for law enforcement. But they're taking a moment to look at that disinvestment trend uh, and to reimagine standards and policies and priorities. Um, am I? Do you feel like I'm describing that accurately? Oh, absolutely. And as a matter of fact, there's a uh, police department in Los Angeles County, uh, the Compton Police. The Compton Police was rental, riddled with abuse and corruption, and the city fired the entire department. Well, what did they do? They subcontracted with the sheriffs. You know what I mean? But I, I think what they're trying to do in Minneapolis is do exactly what you just said, that this is a police department. 97% of the police officers don't live anywhere near Minneapolis. That's a problem in and of itself. And so they're taking a moment to say, what are our issues? How should we go about keeping everybody safe? Yeah. And we will see what they come up with. Again, it's trying to be, it's being characterized almost like anarchy. And I don't think that the elected officials in Minneapolis are irresponsible and they're trying to bring about um, anarchy. Yeah, me too. Well, we have some questions coming in on Facebook. So uh, let's go ahead and turn to them. I'm gonna ask my district director, Jenny, to just sort of read them out. Okay, so the first one is from Ayanna Morgan Woodard from Marin City, and she wants to know, how do we empower our minority students in teaching them who they are and how to elevate them in their places of learning when they are already put in an environment that is racially motivated against them and with them knowing that information? Karen? Well, I'm sure your uh, two guests can chime into that maybe now or a little later, but I really believe that you teach history teach history and teach it accurately. And you know, one of the things that has always been so harmful to me is that when we go through these incidences, you know, especially of police violence, you will have people say, well, I've never had a bad experience with the police, so therefore your reality doesn't exist. And what it always perplexes me, why people can't say, I've never had a problem with police, can you tell me about your experience? I, I've not experienced it before. I don't understand it. I'd like to learn. Just the openness <laughs> of, of acknowledging my existence and acknowledging my truth and my experience goes a long way. And so with the students, I think it's the same thing. Those students are afraid. Their families are terrified. The talk, everybody gets the talk. When you talk about the talk in reference to boys, the talk is in reference to girls, too. I went through years of trouble with the police, so bad to the point where I, ha I was a plaintiff in a major lawsuit because the police in Los Angeles essentially tormented activists. And so and even as a, as a child being harassed by the police. So I think just acknowledging that and validating and affirming someone else's experience goes a heck of a long way. But studying history and acknowledging history Whenever we talk about race, I know black folks always worry because, you know, white folks you feel guilty and shamed and embarrassed. And we don't want you to feel that way. That's not <laughs> helpful. That's not productive at all. We just want you to acknowledge what's there. Nobody is accusing you of anything. And so we have to figure out how to have safe spaces to talk about race. And then, you know, uh, Jared, like I said to the caucus, there are some white experts who talk about race. And I think it's super important for them to come in and talk about it from their perspective, because that eliminates the guilt, the, all of that stuff, the, the shame that people might feel. Yeah. Having the conversations, I think, is very important. Well, Curtis and Marshall, stay right there, because I'm coming back to you guys in a minute to 
finish some of these thoughts about how your experience with police and other things is just inherently different than what I've lived. I really am curious about that, but uh, I want to feed a few more questions into Karen Bass before we lose her. So go ahead, Jenny. Okay, here's a great one from Connie Williams. Does the fact that citizens have the ability to own huge arsenals of guns, rifles, etc., ramp up the police presence with these same kinds of weapons? Might the hmm. two be connected? And how might we be able to work on fixing these things? Well, you know what? No, I don't believe they're connected at all. You know why? Because the police are not surveying the communities that have all the guns. I mean, granted, there's, there's plenty of guns in inner cities, but what you're talking about, I think it's something a little different. <laughs> and you don't see the police policing the areas where there's heavy militias yeah. and guns and all of that. They're over policing inner cities. And, uh, and I think that that is, that that is the problem. I mean, the perfect case in point, what happened in Atlanta, yeah. that guy's crime was falling asleep in a takeout line. He lost his life. Why didn't the police just say, hey man, pull over, you're intoxicated. Why don't you walk home? Why don't you call an Uber? Why did they need to arrest him in the first place? Dylan Roof killed nine people. That was a peaceful arrest. They even brought him lunch on the way to the police station. They did not even draw their guns to arrest him. He killed nine people. Nine people, peaceful arrests, falling asleep in Wendy's takeout line, dead. Yeah, we have so many fresh examples of that um, double standard that exposes the racism, the, the armed militia groups in, in uh, Michigan, uh, you know, very menacing presence in the Capitol there. And uh, I don't recall seeing any uh, excessive police force used against them. And yet uh, there was a video just yesterday or the day before of an open carry African-American man who just got instantly swarmed by police. And... Uh, harassed so uh yeah. we, black people should know that those open carry laws do not apply to black people. yeah they, i'm not thrilled about open carry but it does uh <laughs> does reveal the double neither, standard but those are not laws for us yeah <laughs> so next question okay so chanel wants to know it's been demonstrated that when formal police reports that formal police reports are often misleading incomplete and conspicuously lacking information that would incriminate officers for their misdeeds in the absence of cameras, we take these police reports as factual. How can we add accountability to the right of, of police reports? Phone cameras can't be everywhere, and how many other extrajudicial killings have been covered up by false paperwork? Hmm. Well, it, until we change our view of policing, we take their reports even when there are cameras. I mean, <laughs> when the guy that they pushed down, they yeah. said he tripped. Yeah. And then the police officers quit. Right, I think it was over 50 police officers quit when they fired the two police officers that now fractured the guy's skull because they just said that. I think I mentioned that it fractured mm -hmm. his skull and he can't walk. Uh, so again, that's about changing police culture, and that's what this bill. There's no way this bill addresses it in full, but this bill, I think, makes a major step forward. We so much more we need to do. Yeah. Okay. Good. So Reverend uh, Deborah Haff, Hafner Hubbard asks, first she wants to thank you for co-sponsoring the Justice and Policing Act. Mm -hmm. And she's curious to see how you feel this legislation addresses the many recommendations offered in former, pre former President Obama's report from the task force on the 21st century policing. What do you think of Trump's executive order compared to that? Well, Trump's executive order was theater like everything about the president, it was theater. And what he was attempting to do, he was attempting to preempt what we're doing tomorrow. That's all that was. If you read his executive order, it is stuffed with fluff. It really doesn't say very much. It hits on the surface and takes the teeth out. So it, it bans chokeholds unless the officer's life is in danger. Well, who's going to say their life wasn't in danger? Yeah. I mean, that's current law. So he just put in writing what already exists. I'm sorry, that's not current law. That's current policy. Yeah. You would think they just use chokeholds for fun. Of course they say that. So I don't think there's any comparison. And in terms of the 21st Century Policing Commission, you know, we, we take up some of the issues, but it's not comprehensive. We, I think we'll get to all of it um, in January of 2021 when President Biden is sworn in. <laughs> fun to think about that. 
146 days before November 3rd. Okay, so Patrick wants to know, should statements coming from many areas such as businesses, nonprofits, and service organizations promote Black Lives Matter solely, or should they be inclusive with all populations of color? I think Black Lives Matter is a very specific statement because for 400 years, Black lives have not mattered. Yeah. For 256 years, Black lives were commodities, sold. For 100 years after that, I mean, we can't even in 2020 pass a bill outlawing lynching. Two Black men were hung in California, in Southern California, and it was written off as they were suicides. We don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> that has to be investigated. So the point of Black Lives Matter is not to say other lives don't matter, but it's really to raise 400 years of Black lives not mattering, and that is specific to Black lives. Now, do Native American lives matter? Do Latino lives, Asian lives, white lives? Of course they do but attempts to kind of water that down and say that it's everybody or it's all people of color is an absolute attempt to deny the specificity yeah. of what has happened to black people in this country. Yeah, until we can just say black lives matter, we're not really saying all lives matter. And, and be okay with it. But you should know that when we work on legislation like this, we work in complete unity with the Hispanic caucus, the Asian caucus and the Native American caucus. When, when Asians are being attacked because of this whole anti-China line that they're putting out, we're there in solidarity. When kids were put in cages, we're there in solidarity. So make no mistake about it. It is not one over the other, but it is highlighting 400 years of reality. So, so on that subject, Karen, um, you know, they say about Donald Trump that he says the silent part out loud um, he has just presented so many examples of dog whistle racism, overt race, every flavor of racism you can imagine uh, for the last three and a half years. Do you think that that has helped um, demystify some of this systemic racism for the American people so that unlike uh, three years ago when Black Lives Matter was pretty unpopular, um, it's wildly popular today. People are connecting dots like they didn't before. You know, I think that uh, what he has done is he has horrified a lot of white people. And I think that's wonderful. I mean, I remember uh, um, Boston and Charlottesville and, um, you know, to see tens of thousands of white folks out protesting against racism to see all the white folks wearing Black Lives Matter t-shirts. I mean, you should know how good that makes me feel because black folks feel like we got this 300 pound burden and we want to share it. Yeah. <laughs> so what my white friends don't really realize is that when white people talk about racism, you have credibility that we don't because it's expected of us. And it's said, well, you're just pulling the race car. But when white folks stand up and say, this is horrible. And so the one thing about uh, Trump that I always say, kind of jokingly, but I do mean it. Remember when he uh, won, he said he was going to bring us all together? Well, I think he has brought us all together. He's brought us all together in opposition of him. But we <laughs> now have a heightened awareness of so many issues that people see connected that they saw before in silos. I mean, everybody understands immigration now in ways that they didn't at all. You know, Islamophobia, I mean, you just go down the list. Whereas before environmental folks might have worked over here, anti-racist folks might have worked over here. But we see the connection when you have somebody at the top who attacks everybody. I mean, he has nerve to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma yes. on Juneteenth the 99th anniversary of a massacre. So many black people were killed that they don't even know how many died. And there's mass graves that now archeologists are looking. Black folks were doing well, the town was doing well. They called it Black Wall Street and they burnt the town down to the ground and killed over 300 people. That's the day he chooses to go have a speech on race. And by the way, the speech on race is gonna be written by Stephen Miller. So Perfect. what do I expect from this race? I mean, from this speech? 
I think it's going to be an anti-immigrant speech. And I think he's yeah. going to talk about how he's done so much for black people yeah. by hating immigrants. Yeah. And we will stand in solidarity against that. That That's great to hear. I think your prediction is 100% right. He's going to try to turn black folks against uh, immigrants. And it's just the same old, same old. Um, you know, during the George Floyd memorials, um, you alluded to this a moment ago. I want to just do a little follow up. This term being exhausted came up a lot. Uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, to, so many of the speakers talked about just the feeling in black Ameri America of exhaustion. You talked about it as this burden that we've been carrying. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, and that's something that obviously folks that look like me, you know, need to appreciate because we don't have that same experience. Yes, and Dr. Robinson will tell you, you want to talk about high blood pressure and diabetes and <laughs> obesity? <Woo. laughs> the fatigue. <laughs> it's the burden. And, and what I've said everywhere is that when I was at that memorial and I looked up and I saw that gigantic portrait of George Floyd and I saw he was born in 1973, 1973 was the year I started working on police abuse. That was 47 years ago. That's fatigue. <laughs> that is serious fatigue. And I used to, when I was young, I used to try to leave the country at least once a year so I could take a vacation from racism. Seriously. Wow. It's like, slip me out of here. Give me a week mm -hmm. off, please. <laughs> wow. And, 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 it, and it's serious. And it does, it does have health consequences, doesn't it, Mr. Dr. Robinson? You know, just being black is a risk factor for diabetes, hypertension, <laughs> obesity, and everything else that we have to, you know, endure. So, so 100%. And stress is a proven factor for disease. So, so, so being black is stressful, no doubt. Well, I've got one more question for you, Karen, and then you are welcome to hang around as long as you want to listen to these two gentlemen uh, on a more localized basis. But we've got one more for you. I have another I've been Zooming since 11 o'clock this morning. <laughs> yeah, but the whole world wants to talk to Karen Bass right now, so we're really lucky to have you. Go ahead, Jenny. All right, so Laura wants to know, among these sweeping proposed reforms, which ones do you think will pass without limiting amendments? And among those, which do you feel are standalone effective and safe from workarounds by lobbyists, unions, and other threats? So you should know that, uh, I well, it might be possible that one or two amendments pass tomorrow, but I don't think so. We're moving this as a package. We're not breaking this up. And now we'll see what happens, you know, over in the Senate, but but the, the goal is not to break this up at all. The minute we start breaking it up, it's over. Are, are, these, are there pieces of this? There people coming after it. Are there pieces that you feel like are the most important that we fight for in negotiations with the Senate? Yes, yes, yes. I think changing um, changing the law so that it's easier to prosecute, criminally prosecute officers, reducing willful uh, intent to recklessness, I think is really important, the accreditation and the standards. And then, you know, the no knock and choke hold, it's hard, actually. I'm going to go down the whole list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not sure where I would pick it apart. I love the grants. So I, I, I'll struggle with that one. Well, Karen, it's just such a, a privilege to be your colleague and such a pleasure to have you in this conversation tonight. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me, and it was wonderful meeting you, Marshall. And, nice and, to meet uh, you. Great to meet you. And I'll see you in Washington next week. I'm sorry for this home haircut and this ugly beard, but, you know, we're all <laughs> getting by. Did you, you must have snuck out of state to get a beauty treatment or something, though, because they don't allow those here in most of California. <laughs> Bye -bye. All right. Well, Curtis and Marshall, uh, here's what I want to ask each of you. I'll start with Curtis. Um, in some ways, you and I have had similar lives. We both have lived in Marin County, this, this privileged uh, bucolic enclave for, for several decades. We both went to the greatest uh, you know, university in America, UC Santa Barbara. You got better grades than me, and you were a student body president, but you know, we were both there. Uh, but I think your life experience has been really different uh, than mine when it comes to this issue of race. And I remember a few years ago, you sharing with me that in Mill Valley, uh, you had an experience that could have led to, you know, one of these situations we read about, where an unarmed black man uh, is a victim of excessive force because you were literally just moving a television out of your doctor's office. 
Uh, can you just share what you would like white Americans to understand about living your life as a black man? Yeah, thank you, Jared. Um, it's a it's it's a deep question, but I'll start with the story just to remind yourself and the audience here that it, it's it's a different it's a different feeling to be a black man here in America. And even if you do everything right, you go to the best schools, you go to the best colleges, you get your medical degree, um, and you actually come back to the home in the place where you grew up and you set up your family medicine office no more than a mile from your home that you were raised in. And you take care of the community uh, just as it is yours. And you walk out of your office one, at, one evening uh, after a full day of work caring for the community and you jump in your car and uh, within 100 meters the siren goes on and the lights flash and I get pulled over. And this isn't the first time this has happened to me, and this is a common story for, for almost every black person here in America. And the officer, of course, asked what I was doing coming out of that office. And I did have to tell him that was my office, sir, and um, I was coming, I'm going home from work. And so he did run my place, look at my license, and let me go. Um, and I, of course, I was well behaved. I'm always well behaved when, when I'm in front of, of an officer and I share, show respect 100% of the time. The issue was not that episode. It was about a month later when, again, after a full day of work, uh, I'm walking out of my office and I'm six or seven years into my work here in Mill Valley. Um, and I see zipping across the, the road that same officer who flashed his lights on me and screeched the brakes right there. And then I heard behind me a couple <laughs> claps, and I turn around and there's an officer with his hand on his gun and his flashlight ready for me to react. And I recognized the guy. I kind of just waved at him. He noticed I recognized him. He waved the other officer back, and the guy ran back to his car, which was hidden and parked on the other side of, of the parking lot. And so these types of experiences are, are, are common to us. My brother was uh, asked what he was doing on the bicycle, that he was riding his bicycle on the deck of his house, the house that we grew up when the sheriff pulled, pulled over, uh, drove by. Um, at UC Santa Barbara, Jared, um, I was walking to a friend uh, for some late night TV and the two, you know, there in Isla Vista, the officers have bicycles and they rode up to me and again, they asked what I was doing coming out of that house. So, so it's not just those things that happen to us on, uh, commonly, but what I am experiencing now in my profession is that we are seeing this type of attitude in much more subtle ways at all levels of our profession, um, not just in the streets, but in the boardrooms, not just um, walking here and there, but in the supermarkets or wherever it is. It, it's something that we need to talk about as a nation and we, we need to continue to, to share the stories and to uh, offer this to to folks who who don't understand this or can't see it. Yeah. Um, so so thank you for asking, Jared. Well, it's so different than anything I've experienced in in my life. And other white people have the same. Uh, Karen Bass is exactly right. We have to find a way to understand the different stuff you've lived through. So, Marshall, let me turn to you and ask the same question. Um, what have you experienced that that you think it's really important for? folks like me and other white people to, to understand and accept. Yeah, um, I've had similar uh, run-ins with police officers. Um, growing up in a small town, kind of like Fort Bragg in the Central Valley, I mean, I've, I wrote about this online recently, but um, I'll share a couple of uh, instances. But I mean, the number of times I was pulled over in the two years I had my license in that town, um, the CHP would see me on the highway, it was a small town, two lane highway, and they would turn around when they saw who was driving. Follow me for a little while, wasn't speeding or anything, pull me over. And never once do they, you know, 
always license registration, always where are you going? What are you doing? Um, I've been late to work several times being pulled over, um, getting fix it tickets for things that like tinted windows when all my, you know, peers had way darker tin windows than I did. Um, one instance I, uh, I wrote about as well was, you know, being profiled and being told I fit the profile for someone they're looking for. And it's always, you fit the profile. I've been pulled over a few times for this, but in person once, and I, I, there were no guns drawn on me, but I also, like Curtis said, I did not um, resist. I was angry. I asked what, what it was about, but honestly, I was at a movie theater, um, went into the restroom, had a couple of police officers waiting for me when I walked out of the movie theater um, or out of the restroom, and they asked for my ID. Um, and I didn't understand what I possibly could have done wrong. Mm -hmm. But of course, their only explanation was, you fit the profile. And at first I said, this is not okay. But, and you know, and I caught myself because the fear, there's that mistrust. And this is something that we need to fix in the, with the police departments. There's no trust there. I did not, if I had resisted or even thought about moving or walking past them, who knows where I'd be right now, you know? Yeah. Um, so I complied and yes, they let me go, but I was shook. I didn't see a movie. I left that theater um, and drove off. I just, but it's constant things like that. Um, but, in, and like Curtis was saying a moment ago, there's more subtle things as well, um, everywhere, all the time. Um, I've been completely ignored in the grocery store locally by, by folks in line, um, you know, this is what I, you know, I used to deliver beds for my father-in-law and locally. And some of the looks I would get, and you know the look, I mean, Curtis knows what I'm talking about. You, you know the look, I would pull up with the merchandise they paid for to install a bed into their house. And the looks I got and the curt um, attitudes I received, it was very obvious they were uncomfortable with me being there, but I was just there doing my job. So. Yeah. Well, we often hear, I, I'm sure that this uh, systemic racism it applies equally to both genders, but there's a little bit of a different aspect of it when it comes to black men. And we hear about moms having the speech with their uh, African-American boys. Uh, tell us about that. Did you get the speech? Uh, is this a speech that you think uh, black boys in America still need to get? Um, yeah, Jared, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm of mixed race. My mother's white and my father's black. And um, when you have a white mother, it's very different because that white mother, not that black mothers will not advocate the same way, but there's something that the white, the, the black kids of white mothers, there's an advantage. President Obama had that advantage. I feel like I have that advantage. And so when it comes down to uh, injustice uh, for me um, and my mother goes to the sheriff's department her impact is going to be her, her statements are going to be listened to hmm. in a different way than if my mother was a black uh, mother and so so yes we have those talks and we've had those talks with my kids and um, uh, but but again I, I, I can't say that I have entirely that experience um, and I don't know how Marshall uh, feels about that. What's well, interesting, a, a, a white mother might be predisposed to, to, to have a more hopeful view of police interactions with, with their child as well. Uh, but what, what about you, Marshall? Yeah, I mean, my, my parents are both black. My dad grew up in Oakland. Um, and, it, you know, they've told me stories, you know, around civil rights and that kind of thing. And race came up quite a bit when I was younger. Um, you know, there was a group of kids that picked on me every single day, third to fifth grade, uh, me and another buddy of mine, a white buddy of mine. Um, and they called me the N-word most days of the, most days at school, um, every day mostly. And it's, it's, so I came home one day and I asked my mom this was early on what, you know, what was going on? Why was I being treated this way? And we have had those discussions. My dad has talked to me about, you know, growing up in Oakland and, and how the police perceive you and that kind of thing. And it's, it's not an easy conversation, but it's something that we definitely are having with my kids. Um, my kids are mixed race as well. Um, and it's, it's something they have to be aware of that 
this is the experience that that we're having, honestly. And if you don't have these conversations about race, and I have these conversations with my students um, as much as I can, I do have a couple of black students here and there um, every year, and I'm there. And and I've had a lot of students actually reach out to me recently um, and thank me for being the only black teacher they've had to date. You know, and I didn't have a black teacher till I got to college. You know, and and there was something about feeling like I'm able to hear them in a different way. Um, so these are the conversations we have to have. I mean, my, you know, this was nothing, this was nothing that my parents didn't talk about, but it's something we have to continue talking about. Yeah. Well, Jenny, do we have any questions? And, and I'll just open it up as we get these questions. Uh, I invite um, Marshall and Curtis to jump in and answer as they wish. We'll just tackle them as they come. Well, first of all, a lot of people are really share, uh, expressing empathy and appreciating these personal stories. Very much appreciate that. And Sean wants to know if you would please share proactive measures that we can take up as community members to help in our local communities and with the media to address this. So people want to know what, how they can help. What can we do? What, what do you yeah, think, um, guys? Go ahead, Curtis. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say um, the, the discussion right now has become a personal discussion amongst all of us. And so I think it's appropriate for all of us to take one look in the mirror and check ourselves and make sure that we become anti-racist because just being quiet and being silent like you hear these slogans silence is violence here we all need to do it on a daily basis and stop the racist attitudes that exist amongst all of our society and so what i'm asking of people is to look at themselves in the mirror, check themselves, and whenever they see anything that puts another person of color, specifically a black person down, as if their knee was on their neck, you gotta put a stop to that right away. And so that's what I would ask of my community. I surely love, and I'll just say one more thing real quickly, I was gonna go join Congressman Huffman in San Rafael, <laughs> and, which is about a 20 minute drive from here in Mill Valley. And I got in my car about 425. Both of the exits were um, blocked because the protests were so deep and so big. And 90% white folks who are looking in the mirror, they're checking themselves. They're doing everything they can to stop this, this tragedy that we have been living through for such a long time. Yeah, it's great to see that. What about you, Marshall? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've had a lot of people reach out to me. My wife is white. Um, she's been talking to her friends and sharing stories and getting active. You know, the protests, I love to see the protests. I love seeing my students um, out there protesting in, in Little Fort Bragg. Um, and, and, I, and I love that. But, you know, find out who's leading these things and, and support black authors and, and creators and, and, and lifting um, you know, people of color up rather than solely focusing on, you know, if there's nothing you feel like you can do, contributing a little bit um, to, you know, an author you may not have read um, or been exposed to or something like that. Um, but definitely, um, like Curtis said, looking in the mirror, I have people asking me all the time, what can I do? I feel feel bad. And I, and I get that they feel guilty and bad. And, and I've had to block people on social media, um, people close to me, because I can't keep having that conversation about all lives mattering. I can't, it's, I'm exhausted from it. And, and we were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. I can't keep having that conversation with folks because they're just gonna keep coming back to that point. So if you're one of those folks, you know, look online and, and learn what you're saying. You're saying all lives matter because somehow it's about you. This is not about you, you know? And, and people keep making it about them rather than looking and, and, and trying to help the people that that we need, we need the help, we really do. And we need the support, we need to be heard. So Marshall, let me follow up a little bit on that because you, mm -hmm. you touched on something that uh, I see coming up a lot lately when we talk about the less overt forms of racism, the, uh, the things like the symbols and the place names. And of course, you're, you're at ground zero because you're in Fort Bragg, <laughs> California. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you do, you do hear people say, well, I'm not a racist. This has never been a, a racist intent on my part or my families or my ancestors. Um, it's just a cool place that we've loved living in. And why should my heritage uh, have to change? Um, 
it's a, it's a tough conversation to have because it takes people into an uncomfortable place that even though they may not be a racist, that, that's not good enough. If we are all indirectly supporting some things that have inherent racial content, uh, we've got to think about others as well. What, what, can you, uh, what can you say from Fort Bragg on this subject? I mean, you're right, it's not good enough. Um, you know, regardless of, you know, your intent, yeah, you're not racist, I get that. But you live in a town that's named after racism and the Confederate general, horrible person, you know? And that, and it says nothing about your upbringing, you still lived here. But um, the, it's frustrating because I, I get what people get so hung up, but we, so the other thing is, People get caught up on we've always done it this way, right? right? So it should always be this way. And and just to bring it back to the schools, um, I'm the yearbook advisor, and also um, uh, I I in the Spectrum Club, uh, one of the Spectrum Club um, leaders as well for that club, uh, which is an LGBTQ uh, club. And one of the things I was trying to do as a yearbook advisor is take the gender out of everything, you know? And there was so much backlash about royalty, for example. You know, like it has to be king and queen. Why? Can't it can't just be two people that get nominated, right? The backlash of that is very similar, in my opinion, to the town name change. It's like, I get we've always had the name or we've had the name for a chunk of time that you lived here, but it's not good enough to just say I'm not racist, the name's fine, because it's not fine, you know? When I, when I hear some of those arguments, I, I ask myself, why is that name so so darn important to you. Why does right. that name mean so much? Because it was this this terrible Confederate guy, and and I get that there's, you know, history and memories and things that are very benign associated with it on among some people. But nobody's trying to take away that history or those positive associations. We're just trying to have a conversation about how a black person feels uh, to have to live with that shoved in their face every day. Well, and speaking of that as well, I mean, the number of Confederate flags I've see, I see in town, it's, it's you know, you, you may not, and on campus and students, on students' clothing and stuff like that, this kind of stuff has to stop. I can't, it's hard to go to work. It's hard to be in this little town as one of the few black folks that live here and see a Confederate flag half the time when I'm driving on some, on some truck that passes me. I mean, that's, it's, this has to, st it's not okay. And, and part of it, I think, would, would be a really important step is to change the name of the town. So, Curtis, let's bring it home to the, uh, the bastion of white privilege, Marin County, California, um, where we had our own uh, little debate about a, a Confederate name, a school district uh, called the Dixie School District. A little bit like Fort Bragg, just a, a weird anachronistic name that got passed along decades upon decades, and uh, people came to you know, go through the Dixie School experience and have positive associations. But uh, the more we thought about it and the more people of color thought about why they have to have this name uh, imposed upon them, the more we realized we should just step back and change this name. Uh, and now it's Miller Creek School District and everything's just fine and life goes on. But talk a little about what that revealed in our seemingly woke community here of, of Marin County. Yeah, well, I mean, so, so first of all, I'm so happy that the school district actually had the courage and the, and the strength to, to do the name change because they had a lot of resistance. There was a large part of the community that spoke out against the name change. And so what we're seeing and what we're finding that even in very liberal Marin, um, not everything is okay. There was a time uh, when it was illegal for a white family to sell a home to a black person in Marin County, 1967 to 69. My parents were lucky. My father bought his house in 63. We were the third black family here to buy a home in Mill Valley. We got in under that. And, uh, but, but there have been ongoing things, that, not, not, not to take anything away from Black Lives, Lives Matter, but the high school that I went to, the mascot was the Indian. Yeah. And so, so we mine, mine was the Redskins. And oh, no, I mean, so, yeah. so we took care of all that over time. So yes, Marin is liberal, but, but really we have so much more work to do, Congressman. And, and I'm just so excited that, 
that this is the moment. This is the moment where we have more people talking about this than ever. This is the moment that we have black mayors who are front and center in our country leading the march. Yeah. These women, black mayors from D.C. and Atlanta yeah. and in Chicago and, and San Francisco, Mayor London Breed. I mean, this is a special time for all of us. So let's not let this moment leave us. Let's create a bigger moment with a bigger movement that enters politics and that you can sweep up into the Congress and make change for the good of all of us, Congressman Huffman. What a great That's sentiment. I appreciate that. Jenny, do we have more questions? You know, there is a question that's coming from a trustee in Sonoma County. Okay. And she wants to know what Marshall and Curtis think about the role of police officers on school campuses. And um, they want, she wants to know your perspective. Do you think they're useful? And what should their roles be uh, to, build, to build community or to enforce laws? Uh, go for it, Marshall, and then I'll follow up. Yeah, um, we actually recently uh, have a police officer on campus again. We didn't for a little while, but they are on campus often enough to deal with uh, kids that bring drugs on campus or, or get in fights, stuff like that. Um, you know, I wish we didn't, I don't think we necessarily need them. Um, we could use other supports. The, the police officer could be doing something else, I'm sure. Um, but I, I, really don't, I really don't know the role. Um, I would like there to be a very clear role rather than, um, I mean, more of a support role, I think, and helping these kids and redirecting them rather than um, punishing them or getting them in trouble for something or scaring them, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm a county school board president this year. I've been on the school board for the last 15 years. And this discussion has come up not only with the county supervisors, but also with the county school board. And the, the, the thing about Marin County, it, we have a special superintendent, uh, Superintendent Mary Jane Burke, and she understands the importance of relationships and collaboration. So, so we have a 20 year uh, uh, movement here on, on on a relationship with with the police department the sheriff's department um, we do have two resource officers they're really there to 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 support um, the, the, the the school in a way that isn't um, threatening and and they have to go through special training and they have to actually apply to become one of these resource officers um, we call them public safety officers we're not calling them police um, but again I still am not 100% comfortable with that. I grew up in a time when we didn't have police officers in our schools. And, um, and so, you know, I was in, at UC Santa Barbara, I was kind of against the military recruiting on campus. So, so it, it is hard for me to accept that as the current school board president, and I'm trying to make heads of that. Um, there is a discussion right now uh, through the supervisors group about the budget and whether these funds are appropriate. And again, I don't know where everybody's going to come down on that one, but it sure creates for further discussion and, um, and more possibly newer ways to do it. Yeah. So. I'll just chime in that uh, you know we talk about these, these policies and institutions that perpetuate some of these systemic problems. Uh, some of it is the way we fund police. And uh, for example, I've been talking to the Humboldt County Sheriff, Billy Hansel, about this. If he wants to go get a federally funded uh, drug enforcement officer, he can apply for a COPS grant from, from the United States of America, and they will pay for a few years of this person's position. We don't have anything like that when it comes to social workers that Sheriff Hansel might want to, you know, have work with the homeless community or work on substance abuse issues, and he would love to be able to do that. Uh, he doesn't want to just militarize. He wants to have a much more nimble and community-based approach to these issues, and I want to work on, at the federal level, you know, changing some of the incentives and the funding messages that we send with the way we've created a few of these programs. So. Um, that's probably a good note to end on. Our, our time is up, but uh, let me just thank my incredible guests, the great Karen Bass, Curtis Robinson, Marshall Carr, and everyone who logged in and joined us in a, a great and I think really timely and important conversation tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman.